Okay, looks like uh, we have everybody. Uh, welcome to Jillian uh, Ramirez's final PhD defense. Uh, Jillian has been a member of the department for I think nine years. So started as a BS student in uh, Joe Wang's lab and uh, was there for all four years of undergrads, had a very productive time in the group there, um, and then switched over to my group for his PhD, where he's been for the last five uh, academic years. And Julian has been uh, an outstanding member of the lab, has done uh, worked on a number of collaborative projects, including uh, the work that he'll talk about today, which is his core work on the use of metallic nanoparticles and graphene and hexagonal boron nitride as biomechanical sensors. And I think uh, the, the inflection point for Julian and his uh, career in my group was when I, I really threw him into the hot water uh, toward the end of his uh, second year when uh, I asked him to uh, travel to MD Anderson Cancer Center to put his uh, prototype devices on um, on a cohort of head and neck cancer patients. And I think if somebody uh, had asked me to do that at, uh, at his age, then I probably would have uh, freaked out, but Julian did it uh, cool as a cucumber. Um, we got some really good data and it was the start of an excellent collaboration. So I'm really looking forward to his, uh, his seminar and let's welcome him to the stage. Thanks for the intro, Darren. I really, I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah. Um, like Darren mentioned, my name is Julian. I'm a fifth year PhD student in this lab. And today I'm going to be talking about the work that I've done for the past five years. And the way that I could kind of encompass the entirety of this work has been the use of metallic nano islands and two dimensional supports as um, devices for medical, mechanical biosensors. So to kind of give a little bit of context, this is a specific material that I've worked on that has been made in house. And I've just my job has been mostly to figure out applications for the use of this material. So before I get into the work that I've done specifically, I wanna provide a little bit of context in the field that I'm working in or in the space that I work in. And that space is the, the field of wearable physical sensors. So within this field, there's a wide, there's vast amounts of work that has been done in the development of you know, specific wearable devices that can monitor a wide array of things. So for example, on the top on the left hand side, you have temperature sensors in order to you know, map the, the human body's temperature in case you had, you know, if you're under disease such as a flu and stuff like that. We have pressure sensors that are usually used to monitor the pulse or the heartbeat that a specific patient might have. On the bottom, you have sensor integrated platforms. So these are types of devices that do more than one thing. So you can monitor strain and humidity at the same time. You can do things kind of a nice example here is the ability to monitor the body temperature and also do drug delivery. Now, the field that I've decided to kind of focus on is the field of strain sensors. The reason why that is is uh, mainly for two things for two reasons. Uh, one of them being that the mechanism to detect strain is really easy in this field. So if you can imagine a, a wire, a copper wire that you're able to stretch, that in turn will give you a increase in resistance. And in that way you can monitor any type of movement. So here you have a couple of, of examples. So you have people who have been able to monitor human in motion, uh, muscle movement, and even stuff like fingers. So if you can incorporate more than one sensor into a glove, you can, you know, uh, be, you're able to map basically movements in the hand. So I've, I've done something similar, but I've decided to focus more on health, uh, um, health based applications. So on the right hand side, you have two big branches of this field. So the ability to do biological signal monitoring. So this entails the ability to monitor strains of subtle movements in the body. So the pulse, swallowing, speaking, stuff like that. And then there's also, you know, applications for wider strains. So for human motion, so you can imagine, or you can see an example here, of where a strain sensor is attached to the knee and they're able to monitor the movement of the knee over a wide array of exercises such as walking, jogging, and even squatting. So, the, like I mentioned, the particular, oh, one before I kind of move on, one of the things that is, uh, some figures are merit that are used in this field to kind of monitor or qualify the performance of these sensors. One is the gauge factor. So the way that we define gauge factor is the change in resistance divided by its baseline and then divided again by the strain that you're applying. So to kind of give you an idea of the numbers that we're looking for, conventional strain sensors that you get out of Radio Shack have a gauge factor of one. Um, also another thing that we're looking for in a device is its stretchability. So how far we can stretch the device before it fails. And 
to kind of give you context of what's an acceptable range, the human body at most, the skin of the human body at most can stretch up to 50%. So here you have a chart of various works that people have done in the field and their respective gauge factors and stretchability. So as you can see, we have two types of sensors that have mostly been worked on. So you have capacitive type sensors, whereas you have two plates, two metal plates that you basically push together or pull apart. And in that way you're able to back out the strain and you have resistive type sensors. So this goes back to the analogy that I gave you of being able to stretch a copper wire and see a change of resistance. So as you can see, resistive type, resistive type sensors have a higher gauge factor than, than capacitive type and the ability to stretch it kind of varies depending on the materials that you're using. So the challenge here is to be able to go past 100% strain and have gauge factors higher than 64. So kind of the material that we've been working on in our lab is um, palladium nano islands on top of single layer graphene. So why are we using this material as opposed to anything else? Um, it actually possesses really nice and unique properties. So this material is able to detect strains as low as 0.001%. And to kind of put into perspective what that might mean, or, you know, how, what type of strains you can pick up. If you were to get your hair and stretch its diameter by an atom, that corresponds in scale to 0.001%. Not only that, you're able to stretch this material up to 9% strains. So generally when you have a, a sensor that can detect strains as low as 0.001%, the maximum strain that you could apply is 0.2, and this beats that by more than an order of magnitude. So it's really ideal for the, for the ability to develop devices for wearable strain. So, you can kind of see an example here by a previous grad student, Alex Zaretsky, and he kind of provided a proof of concept to see what this could be used for. So when I came into the lab, that was the question that I wanted to answer was, can we provide clinically relevant data using this material? So the first application that I went to and Darren kind of mentioned about was um, in the field of head and neck cancer. So why do we even care about this? Um, so head and neck cancers account for approximately 4% of all cancer cases in the US. There's around 30,000 diagnoses per year and 7,000 deaths. So while the mortality rate the mortality rate might not be that high, it is the problem isn't over after they go through radiation or surgery. You can develop muscle fibrosis or scar tissue in the muscles. And here's a diagram of the possible muscles that can develop this fibrosis. And if you develop fibrosis, you develop a condition called dysphagia, which essentially is you have a painful time swallowing and you have a dysfunction. This affects up to 39% of patients that end up being cancer free. And they could lead to malnutrition and even severe cases death. So how do clinicians that, that monitor this disease, how are they able to kind of classify how bad someone's dysfunction is? Um, the test and the gold standard is a modified barium swallow. So this is a complete assessment of a patient's swallow and what it entails is the recording of a patient under x-ray and see how a food goes down um, the esophagus or maybe even not the esophagus. So you have an example here in the bottom right where a patient is swallowing a food and you can see the entire travel or the entire timeline of when a, when a food or a bolus goes down the esophagus. So what they're looking for mostly is this thing that epiglottis needs to close. close. So the epiglottis is this trap door right here. And if you have a dysfunction, that door doesn't close fully. And what happens is that food is able to travel down your lungs, as you can see here in this tiny stream. So if you split that stream and you get water in your lungs, that's a really bad thing. So this, would, this gold standard provides some way to monitor that. However, it has quite a bit of drawbacks. First, it's really expensive. So this test, it, every single test of the MBS for a patient is around $4,000 and that's with insurance. Um, because of its, you know, the expensive nature of the, of the test and also the equipment that's needed to do this test, these tests are only available in the clinic. So a patient on average gets a, this test around three times a year. So every four months and kind of on the user side or when you're thinking about the patient, this test exposes them to radiation and the food that they're swallowing is impregnated with barium. So on their end, they find that really intrusive and kind of really un an uncomfortable test to go under. So the idea here was to see if we can develop a complement that you could deploy at home, and that would be in the form of a wearable device. So by developing a wearable strain sensor that the patient could wear you know, on a daily basis or even a weekly basis, you can get data on, on a more regular basis than the MPS. So the questions that we were trying to answer with this project was not only if, if, you know, if this sensor would work or not, it's not just a utility test. We wanted to see if we could get insights into you know, such thing as swallowing strength and time. Can we differentiate signals based on the food type? And that's important because in the MBS, they go under different food types. The test goes under different types. So liquids, paste, or solids. So we're doing kind of a parallel test in that sense. And it, we really want to boil down the question is, are we working with a wearable MBS or kind of a swallowing Fitbit where you're just counting the number of swallows, but you're not really getting any insight into the patient's health um, status. So 
once we developed this device, the first thing that we wanted to do was, you know, establish a baseline as to how these signals can look like. And the way we did that was to test it on a human subject. So this is someone who doesn't, who has never had cancer, is a healthy person and is some, a member of the lab. And the way that, the reason why we did that is to provide a guideline. So as you can see here, you have four different types of signals that you can get. So dry swallow is essentially um, instructing the subject to, to swallow their own saliva. The water swallow is 10 mLs of water, so a really small amount, but that's the amount that's used in the MBS. The yogurt would mimic the paste-like substance that's used in the MBS, and a cracker is the substitute for the solid food. So while doing this test, we followed the protocol that's used in the MBS, and we were able to get different signals based on the food consistency. And the end goal here was to see if we can correlate sensor data to MBS videos. So before we kind of jump into correlating the data, we actually went to the clinic at MD Anderson and tested this device on multiple patients. So seven non-dysphagic patients, so people who have a healthy swallowing function, and seven patients who are dysphagic and suffer from the dysfunction. So I'll boil down a little bit the main endpoints here, and it's really two points that you need to look out for. So the first is the amount of time it takes to swallow 10 milliliters of water. So non-dysphagic patients who have a normal swallowing function usually can swallow this volume in two and a half seconds, at most three seconds, and that's indicative of a normal swallow. On the other hand, with dysphagic patients, you have much longer times for them to swallow, and much, and not only that, as you can see kind of on the right-hand right -hand side, you have 10, 16, and eight seconds. It's also the number of instances of strain. So with normal patients or patients who aren't dysphagic, you have two distinct instances across all these patients. With people who are dysphagic, there's more than that. So it's indicative that they have you know, there's more effort involved in swallowing such a small volume. So once we kind of saw this data, we wanted to see why was, what was the reason behind having such drastic differences in time and number of, uh, of swallows that needs to be performed. So we went ahead and correlated the strain data to the patient's respective MBS test. And as you can see here, we were able to attribute the specific instances and in strain to behavior in the swallowing function. So in a normal swallowing function, you have two main phases. So the first phase is, once you intake the food that you're about to swallow, you use the tongue and you push it up to the roof of your mouth to push the food to the back of your throat, and that's the first phase. The second phase is when your food goes from the back of your mouth down to your esophagus, and that requires the epiglottis to close, and that's when you have the most amount of muscle um, activity. So that's good for a normal swallowing function. However, in a non in a non-normal swallowing function, you act, these patients actually require more than one swallow to clear 10 milliliters of water. So you can think about that. That's it's pretty shocking to see how many times they've had to swallow for such a small amount of water. But nonetheless, that's really the reason why we see such these, you know, such drastic differences. So, as we were doing these tests, there was another thing that we had to look out for. As you can imagine, when you're dealing with a mechanical sensor, it will pick up any type of mechanical activity. So you can run the risk of being able to pick up movements that aren't corresponding to swallowing. So we were trying to see if we could find a way to, to pick out or have a clinician distinguish swallowing events from non-swallowing events or artifacts as we call them. So we thought about combining more than one sensing modality to get away, to get around this. And one of the modalities that came up was surface electromyography. Now this sensing modality, it detects the electrical activity of muscles. So when, you, when you're specifically firing these muscles, the SEMG sensor will pick up this activity. So, we're trying to see if we can combine these modalities to be able to distinguish these events. And we have some indication that it can be possible. So you can see in the first example here on the right hand side, we have a patient and we ask them to turn their head, you know, basically to the left and then back to the center, have them intake of a, a food type. In this case, it was 10 milliliters of water and then perform the swallow. And as you can see, we don't have such, we don't have such a significant activity in the, you know, the muscles underneath the chin when they're turning their head but we do see a drastic change in the resistance and that's, you know, that's expected. However, when you're doing in, when you are using these muscles to perform the swallow, you see a higher activity in electromyography, which means that these muscles are firing more significantly than when they're turning their head. And you don't, if you were just to have this, the plot on the bottom, you wouldn't be able to distinguish that. Now, this is a little more clear in the next slide. So you can see where we ask the patient to cough. We don't see any, uh, electrical activity at all, but we see a little bit of strain activity with these three individual peaks, which are indicative of the three cough we ask them to do. And same thing, when you ask them to take in a food and to swallow, we have a little bit more activity. So there is an indication that we can combine more than one modality to be able to pick out the relevant events that we want to analyze. So once we did that, there was another case that we wanted, to, another thing that we want to try and see if we can find a more robust way to analyze the data rather than just using the, eye, the human eye. So 
we collaborated with people in the UC, in the computer science department and we performed two machine learning classification tasks so this is using a computer in order to analyze and classify the data so the first task the first task that we wanted to do was to see if we can distinguish different signals based on the food type so as you can see on the left hand side we you know we do multiple swallows for a specific food so for water for yogurt for a cracker we have the computer train or basically figure out what the average signal would look like for a specific food type, which is the curve in blue. And then if you input a new signal and say, look, can you classify this new signal based on what you already know? Can you give me the accurate you know, food type that this person was swallowing? And the accuracy of that task was 86.4%. And the reason why we picked this task in particular was because with MBS videos, they are trying different food types. So in a video, you can diff definitely see when something looks like a paste in the water, but with the strain data, you won't be able to see it. So we're trying to see if we can find a way to do that without you know, having to guess or require humans to do the guesswork. Um, the second task that we, you know, that we wanted the algorithm to do was to distinguish a patient who suffered from a mild case of dysphagia versus a healthy subject. And the reason why we picked a, you know, a mildly dysphagic patient as opposed to someone who had a severe case was because if you can think about this being a deployable device, and patients wearing this on a daily basis, on a daily basis, the changes on a day to day won't be as drastic as, for example, four or eight, or eight months. So this algorithm is going to have to be able to distinguish very tiny differences on a day by day basis. And sure enough, we see that here. So we train the data again to give us a, a, a average of what the curve would look like. And by inputting a new data, we're able to classify and we're able to get an accuracy in this case of 94.7 percent, so a little bit higher. But it's interesting to point out that the difference in time that it takes to, to swallow, so a healthy subject takes around two and a half seconds, whereas the mildly dysphagic patient takes around three, could account for why it's so much more accurate in the second task as opposed to the first task. So to kind of summarize this work, palladium nanoislands and graphene are able to detect swallowing events by measuring skin deflection. So we're able to discriminate helping swallowing function and dysphagic swallowing. We're also able to correlate the sensor data to the gold standard in the MBS. And we're also able to develop some proof of concept machine learning tasks to you know, provide some a more robust way to analyze the data. So on top of that, by pairing sensor modalities, we're able to distinguish swallowing events from non-swallowing artifacts. And that's great because that way, when if we are able to, if we are able to you know, deploy this device, clinicians are gonna have a hard time able, you know, um, basically reading into the data. So it's great to be able to, you know pinpoint the specific data they should be looking at. However, you know, every, you know, every single project has its ups and downs. And we also wanted to see the ways that we can improve this for the next step. And what we noticed more than anything is that this specific device was limited by a flexible substrate. So because of it, when you're working with a flexible substrate, you can't go to, you can't go to strains more than 10%. So we're trying to see if we can stretch this a little bit or basically open up the, the high end of the working range for this material. So that's what I decided to do for my second project. And the way that I wanted to do that was to combine, you know, our material with, you know, materials that can stretch higher than 10%. And the one that, you know, basically came to mind was P.PSS. So this is a conductive polymer that's widely used in the literature. So this material, it's kind of like a stretchable conductive plastic, if you will. So by treating this polymer with different formulations, there's been work that, you know, that allows this material to stretch up to 50%, which is basically five times more than we can stretch our material. So the idea here was if we can combine these two materials and get the best of both worlds, can we get a material that basically allows us to, you know, monitor any human motion. So the idea here is basically by combining these two, one of the other questions we want to see is if we can, you know, pick up more than one biosignal at the same time, which is really important in cases such as sleep apnea. So to kind of provide a little bit of context, sleep apnea is your interrupted breathing during sleep. So it's this in to kind of put it in layman's terms, this is like the more severe cases of snoring. So while it might not sound that bad, there's a lot of side effects to this uh, condition. So first of all, you get a limited oxygen intake, which if you don't get enough oxygen, you have a tons of complications. And one of them is the increased, re increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So again, when we're always thinking about making a, a, a health monitoring device, we want to compare it to the gold standard or kind of look at the gold standard as a reference. So the gold standard here is a polysomnography exam. So and in layman's terms, that's exact is essentially just a sleep test. So as you can see here on, with this person in particular, they have a tons of sensors being attached to them as they go into sleep. And it records a wide array of data. So you can record brain waves, blood oxygen, heart rate, breathing, you know, and basic limb movements. Um, some of the drawbacks, the cost of this exam is really expensive. So for a home test, which is essentially the doctor giving you the equipment and you place this on yourself in the comfort of your home, 
that test is $1,300. But if you want to do it in a, you know, in a hospital or in a clinical setting with professionals monitoring your data, that costs $4,700. So there have been some advances in trying to find a way to make this a little bit, you know, more affordable, but most of these advances have been in minimizing the sensing modalities or basically improving the electronic side. So as you can see here on the top right, you have a device where it's giving you blood oximetry data or monitoring the blood oxygen, and, and it, it's able to feed that data to Bluetooth, but however, that's only one modality and that's only one signal that they're picking up. On the bottom, you have another case where they developed a neck brace that you would basically wrap around your neck, and then you have an ear clip where they monitor the same thing, the oxygen content in your blood. Um, However, there's not a whole lot of focus on materials consideration, which is the approach that we have in our project. So the first thing that we wanted to do was to characterize this new material because we had never worked with it before. So the first thing we wanted to see is if we could conserve the sensitivity by combining these materials. And sure enough, we see that on the top register. So here we're subjecting this, the, the material to 0.001%. So this is just a bulk formulation of P.PSS. It has no nanoscopic or nanomaterials in it. As you can see, we don't get a, a signal at all, but if you import you know, with the controls or with the materials that we worked with before, we see the, the response. And by combining it, again, we see the response and maybe a little bit of an increase in the response, but you know, that could be within margins of error, but we still maintain the same sensitivity. And of course, if we're thinking about a device, we wanna be able to you know, characterize it and see how it performs. So our device is actually able to stretch up to 55%. This isn't 0.5% strain, this is you know, 50%. And sure enough, we get a nice response with both. And what's important here is that the gauge factor, even though it's not that great, that's actually what you would look for if you're trying to pick up more than bio, one biosignal. Because if we have you know, vast differences in the gauge factor at different strain regimes, you can have data, you know, we can have strain saturation, and then eventually we won't be able to pick up more than one biosignal. So lastly, we did a proof of concept study and see if we can you know, say what we aim, do what we aimed out to do in the original, in the original idea. So, we actually attached a tattoo version of this device on the human subject, you know, one of the lab members. And as you can see in the bottom, we're able to pick up more than one bio signal. So the colored rectangles are instances where the subject is inhaling and exhaling, and then the little peaks along the graph are the individual heartbeats. So uh, to kind of summarize this work, by combining both the nanomaterial with P.PSS, we're able to, you know, retain the sensitivity of the original material and incorporate the stretchability of the new material. That you know, amplifies our window from 0.001% up to 70%, which is something that we had never seen with our material before. And we picked out a nice uh, proof of concept uh, on body study to kind of highlight the, the utility of this device by being able to detect multiple bio signals using one device and even one material. So after working with, you know, trying to improve the, the higher register of the material, we wanted to focus on the, on the lower register. Um, so when, with the original paper that was done by a previous grad student, Alex Zaretsky, um, we went ahead and kind of did a fundamental study to see how this material worked. And in the lower in the lower end of the of the strain regime, so with 0.001%, we hypothesized that the reason we can pick up these strains is through a mechanism called tunneling resistance. So what this is, is if you take two individual nanoparticles and you put them close together enough, electrons will spontaneously jump from one metallic particle to the other, and that allows for electron conduction. And this only happens in metallic, in, in nanoparticle arrays and stuff like that because of the, quant of the quantum mechanisms or basically the quantum activity of electrons. So while we thought that this was a hypothesis or while we have hypothesized that this could be the reason, it's very difficult to confirm in this material because graphene is also conductive. So it's difficult to determine the possible electron paths that this material takes as it's you know, detecting strain. So we, wanted ahead and, we went ahead and wanted to do um, a study on this. So we wanted to see if we can deconvolute the sensing mechanism by substituting a conductive material such as graphene with something that's insulating. So the material that came to mind was hexagonal bore nitride. So Hexagonal boron nitride turns out to be the ideal substitute for graphene because it has the same crystal lattice structure. There's only a difference of about 2%. However, it has insulating behavior. Its band gap is about 5.9 electron volts. So it's essentially an insulator. Um, so by substituting graphene with this material, we can eliminate the uncertainty. So that was kind of the main goal of this project, but we also wanted to see that if we did a fundamental study, can we fine tune the strain sensitivity and maybe go even a step, you know, an order of magnitude lower and say if we can detect 0.0001%. Um, and of course, we picked out two, diff we did an array of four by four. So we did palladium because that's the material we had been working with so far. 
and we also pick gold because you have a different set. We have a different morphologies that we get with gold as opposed to palladium, and we wanted to see if gold can also pick up the same strains. Then maybe we can start, you know, uh, basically eliminating certain hypotheses out of the possible strain mechanisms. So the first thing that we wanted to do was to characterize how the fil the metallic films form on single layer graphene or on HBN and see if there are any differences. So as you can see in the images, this is kind of a, a the morphology of gold on graphene or HBN for different nominal thicknesses, which means that we're depositing more or less gold. So as you're going from left to right, you're depositing more gold. And as you can see in the images, it seems like the particles are getting either closer together or they start aggregating or, or can start forming connections like bridges. So that's kind of nice to see in here. And it's also nice to point or interesting to point out that there's such vast differences by just replacing you know, a material that's one atom thick. We also did the same thing for palladium, and sure enough, we see some differences in terms of surface coverage or you know, the amount of islands that there are per unit area. However, the differences aren't as drastic in the case of palladium as they are with gold. So while these images are pretty nice, this is only quantitative, you know, sorry, qualitative data. And we want to see if we can get quantitative data or stuff that you can measure. So we actually developed the image analysis software in the lab to kind of see if we can get any you know, numerical results out of this. So by comparing the morphologies across gold, you do see some differences. So on the left-hand side, you have fractional coverage. So that's the amount of, you know, that's the, the coverage that gold has on top of the single layer graphene. And on the right-hand side, we're measuring number of islands per micrometer squared. And that's kind of indicative of, as to how the film forms as you're depositing more metal. So as you can see, when we're comparing gold on graphene on the left-hand side and gold on HBN on the right-hand side, we see there's some similarities or there's very little difference in the fractional coverage across both but the number of islands per micrometer squared is very different. So what that means is that it seems that gold has an easier time of forming a film on graphene than it does on HBN. And we see a similar case with palladium, even though it's not as drastic. So it seems like there's more coverage for graphene as opposed to HBN as you're depositing more metal. And palladium tends to form a film at around four nanometers in the case of graphene. In the case of HBN, that goes up to six nanometers. So after seeing these differences, we wanted to go back to the literature and see if there was any, you know, that had been any work done on figuring out why there's such big differences across these monolayers. And sure enough, we do. So uh, a group, or sorry, a study by Yaziev and coworkers actually found out that there's very big differences between gold and palladium when they're trying to, you know, be absorbed onto the surface of graphene or HBN. So the two main differences that they saw was the binding energy. So the binding energy is the minimal energy needed to separate a metal atom that's on the surface of graphene. For gold, that energy is not that high. It's around 0 0.09 electron volts. With in the case of palladium, that's around you know 10 times or even you know it's an order or two orders of magnitude higher, a little bit less than that. But it's a much higher difference, and because of that, it requires a lot more energy to you know pull out the palladium atom from the 2D surface. Another thing that they saw differences was in the diffusion activation area, um, the diffusion activation barrier. So that's the minimal energy needed to enable particles to move around a surface. So in the case of gold on graphene and HBN, you have very low levels. And while you might have a comparable number in the case of palladium, it's that big difference in the binding energy that accounts for why the palladium morphologies are much closer to each other than in the case of gold. So the second thing that we wanted to do is after characterizing the morphology, we wanted to see if we can if we can measure another way as to when the metallic particles are coming together and forming a film. And the reason why we want to do that is once we can determine when the film starts to form, we can start you know kicking out certain hypotheses such as current tunneling because current tunneling requires that the nanoparticles particles be separated by a gap. So as you can see here, we see a similar results that we saw in the in the microscopy images. So in the case of palladium. The film tends to form around six nanometers, which is something that I pointed out earlier. And in the case of gold, it tends to film, form a film at around 12 nanometers. So by keeping these numbers in mind, we can start to see if we do see strain detection at these thicknesses, then maybe we can start figuring out why that is. So that's the next step that we did. We went ahead and tested the strain response of all these different permutations. So I'll go through the data and try to parse it out. So I'll stick to the case of HB and palladium first. So you have three instances where you don't get any strain sensitivity at all. And that's because we have an open circuit. So essentially no electrons are conducting. And it, that's also, also, be, also tends to be the case where the morphology it, you know, has separate metallic nanoparticles. We do see some strain detection in this material at the larger end of the nominal thickness. And this is when 
you have the palladium particles coming together and forming bridge-like connections. So that's very interesting. I'll jump over to HB and gold because you're just switching out the metal and you're still working with an insulator as the 2D material. In this case, for up to 12 nanometers, we actually don't get any strain sensitivity because there's an open circuit. So again, the particles are separated by discrete gaps. There's no connections, so there's no electrons breed out. However, after 12 nanometers, we do get some conductivity, so we do get a resistance. However, even when we strained this material, we didn't get any sensitivity at all. So that lets us know that gold itself isn't responsible for why we're able to detect these, um, these strains. So the reason why we, why we think that there is a difference between the metal is because gold has a different morphology to palladium, as you kind of saw in the earlier images, and also metals a slightly more ductile material than palladium is. So that could be another reason. So switching over to the case of graphene, where we have two conductors in the material, we see something very interesting. So at first, graphene isn't strain sensitive at all to any type of bending strain that you apply to it. However, as soon as you add metal into the system, it starts, it's able to detect strains as well, maybe not as well as the case of palladium HBN, but still very impressive numbers to in order to detect strain. So the reason we want to kind of go and see if we can parse out the reasons why there were differences or why this behave these materials behaved in a certain way. So we focused on metal graphene first. Um, mostly because we saw kind of a switching effect that as soon as you add a metal into a system, it somehow magically becomes, you know, strain uh, sensitive. So we went ahead and read a couple of papers and what, you know, other groups have seen is that the deposition of metal can introduce a lot of defects into the graphene. So not only do you have stress, you can have stress localized at defect sites and that comes about by a number of ways. So one of the more important ways that this strain defect comes about or this de defect site comes about is the ability for metal to etch graphene when you're depositing it on top. And the way we deposit this is through thermal evaporation. So this is a process that has a lot of heat. And if you don't have your chamber clean enough, there's oxygen present and that allows basically the etching of graphene. And then another thing that's very specific to the case of palladium is that palladium can actually form bonds with graphene and form palladium carbide. And that affects its electrical properties and basically interrupts the ability of graphene to be a great conductor. Um, so something that kind of goes, or another thing that happens and that, and this goes across different transition metals is the fact that metals introduce charge impurities into the system. And that can give a, you know, that can uh, cause graphene to have electron scattering events. And when you have electron scattering into, in your material that can enable the ability to detect strain. So that's another mechanism that's out there that by which you can detect strain. Um, after kind of studying the metal graphene effects, we wanted to go back to HBN and see why certain metal HBN combinations were sensitive to strain. So we went ahead and wanted to study the thermal resistive behavior. The reason why that is, is depending on the metal and basically whether it's a full film or a nanoparticle film, you get very different behavior in the thermal resistive properties. So on the left hand side, there's a study where basically they, they heated up different films of gold, copper, and silver, and they saw that there was an increase in resistance with an increase in temperature. However, when you have a nanoparticle film, you actually see the opposite effect. So you see a decrease in the resistance as you're increasing temperature. And that's an exponential function, which is not the case for bulk metal films where you have a linear increase. So by being able to measure this property, you can kind of find out by what is a primary conduction mechanism and strain detection mechanism. So that's the same thing we did with our materials. So I'll go through this data and parse through it. So in the case of HBM palladium, um, where you have the insulator on the, on the bottom, all three instances gave us a linear increase in resistance as you increase strain. So right away, that lets you know that it starts to behave like it starts to behave like a film and not have a current tunneling mechanism in it. With graphene, we see something very different. So we actually see that the change in resistance as a function of temperature changes by the amount of metal that you put. And while you may think that the negative response might be a current tunneling mechanism, it's important to point out that graphene inherently has a negative TCR. So what could be happening is that the electrons go from traveling through the graphene to traveling through the metal as you're depositing more metal and there's more paths for the electron to take. So while there is a transition, it, it's not conclusive that current tunneling is a mechanism in either of these materials or any of these permutations. To kind of summarize the four main points of this project, all combinations except HBN gold detect strain at some threshold thickness of metal. Um, unpercolated metal films on HBN do not, conduct, do not conduct electrons and then percolated films on HBN, in that case, only palladium can detect strain. Um, in the case of graphene, graphene by itself does not detect strain, but as soon as you add metal to the system, it's able to become strain sensitive and that can be given to a wide array of, of reasons why. So to kind of summarize and um, my overall study, it's been just basically an in-depth um, 
uh, research on this particular type of um, specific type of material. So the, the study of nanolines and graphene. The first thing I was able to do was basically find useful applications of this material. So developing a sensor for wearable healthcare, whether that be swallowing activity or in the ability to pick up more than one bio signal by incorporating new materials such as conductive polymers. And at the end, we would went ahead and did an in-depth study into its, into its mechanisms, how the film grows on the graphene and how it's able to detect strain and why it performs so well. So this is a list of publications. This is uh, specifically for my committee. And we can always revisit this at the private portion of the, of the presentation. And of course, uh, you know, I'm the one that gets to present the work today, but there's a lot of people that helped me out along the way. So, you know, here's a couple of, of names that have worked specifically in the, in the, in the projects that I worked on. So uh, Daniel Rodriguez is one of the people that was kind of my main collaborator in the lab. So shout out to him. Alex Zareski, I mentioned him earlier in my presentation. He was uh, the grad student that kind of worked on this material before you know, the reins were handed over. Um, I won't go through this whole list because I think I'll, <laughs> I'll have another 40 minute presentation for you guys. So I don't wanna spend it that long, but you know, there's a lot of people that I have to thank. I've been you know, in the Lapomi lab for five years and at UCSD nine. So there is a lot of people, friends and family, and you know, people who aren't in the pictures that, that I really have to give thanks to. And of course, you know, the department administrators who do an awesome job of you know, making sure that we're on top of our game and being able to graduate. So, you know, thank you everyone. And thanks for everyone for attending to the talk. I'll, I'll be happy to take any questions.